Um, and what I would like to reference that is this is a book that I bought about four years ago. It's just an awesome book uh, that gives you a lot of insight into the, the history of the company and Mr. Suji, who's the, the founder of Sanrio. And it, it's really an incredible story. This, this uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. Shintaro Suji, who um, will be 81 this year, he became orphaned when he was 13. Uh, he was taken in by some relatives. They, you know, were raising him and kind of setting him on that traditional Japanese path where you're a salary man and you have your job and you do all that. And, and he did that for a few years and then he kind of got the feeling that he wanted to strike off on his own and kind of set his own road. And he's really always taken that path ever since, which I think is really cool for anybody to have that entrepreneurial spirit and be able to go out and successfully start up a company from nothing. Uh, literally, you know, he didn't have uh, he didn't come from a prestigious background or anything like that, and he now uh, is uh, the head of this empire, this incredible uh, billion-dollar company that, that's still privately held. You can't, unfortunately, buy stocks in San Rio. And uh, anyway, he, he set, started off in 1960 or 61. And he was dealing in a lot of textiles, clothing, things like that. But he really started studying a lot of Western uh, Westerners that he had that he had a lot of admiration for, like Charles Schultz. And if anybody saw my peanuts shirt that I was wearing yesterday, it actually came from a San Rio store. And there's very long connections between San Rio and the, uh, I think it's called Peanuts Syndicate. Does anybody know? Is that right? The um, the parent company for all of those, uh, the Peanuts characters, uh, Charlie Brown and so forth. Anyway, Snoopy is just insanely popular in Japan. I was in Tokyo for a week. I can't even tell you how popular Snoopy is. Uh, there's a chain of toy stores there called Kitty Land. And I was in this Kitty Land, and it's like five or six stories. And one floor, everything on the floor was Peanuts. Everything on that floor was Peanuts. The floor below it, Half of the floor was Sanrio, but everything on the one floor was all peanuts. So I, and it's, it's very, very popular. Anyway, uh, so that was, that was one of his big heroes. He was fascinated in the whole character goods industry, which had not yet taken off in Japan at that point, like in the 60s. And he you know, had some deals that he tried, like with Mattel and some Barbie, Licensing it did not really work very well in Japan at the time. Um, he had, he actually set up a deal with Hallmark that was a failure in the 60s. They weren't ready for Western style greeting cards there yet. But I can tell you, I was in the Sanrio Gift Gate store just a few days ago, and it's in the, the same building that the Sanrio headquarters is in. There were racks and racks of greeting cards, and if you flip them over, that little seal that means that you care enough to send the very best. Uh, so <laughs> obviously they reunited this partnership with Hallmark. Um, and another one of his big heroes was actually Walt Disney. And uh, he was very fortunate back in the 60s to get to meet some of his heroes like Walt Disney and Charles Schultz. And he really wanted to do a lot to sort of emulate these, uh, these people. And an interesting thing, if you think about it, that's, that's different with the Sanrio characters is that they were all created as uh, merchandising tools. They were created as, uh, like Hello Kitty was originally created to be a character for a coin purse. And, oh, here it is, here's the coin purse. That was the uh, original item that Hello Kitty was created for. There were a lot of other items that were introduced at the time, but it's backwards. Because most of the stuff that we think of, like like Peanuts or like Disney characters, they had cartoons. There was a comic strip, and then later there were character goods. And this was exactly the opposite. The character goods were introduced first, and then many years later they did obviously start making some cartoons that were based on these characters. But the the thing that was that's backwards is that the character goods actually came first, and. Uh, 
So I think that's fascinating. Obviously, it's proved to be very successful, but that is one of the reasons that there are two Sanrio theme parks, because, of course, if he was going to be like his hero, Walt Disney, he had to have theme parks. <laughs> so, you know, then you have Pura Land near Tokyo and Harmony Land, which is in uh, Kyoto, which I have not been to, but that will be remedied one of these days, <laughs> I promise you. Uh, anyway, uh, they're, they're, you know, Pura Land is fun, but it's pretty modest, and uh, a lot of his advisors thought he was crazy to try to build this theme park, you know. You've got Tokyo Disney right there, which is a huge attraction, and people are like, you know, you're not going to compete against that, and he really doesn't. He hasn't, you know, made bazillions of dollars off of his theme parks, but they're still open, and they're still going, and, you know, it's just something that he strongly believes in, and what I really found from reading this book was that when he decides he's going to do something, he's going to do it. You know, he's very decisive and he just kind of goes with his instinct about what he's going to do. And I mean, overall, you have to say he's, he's done pretty well because I can just tell you, it's, you, I don't think you could walk a block any, anywhere in Tokyo anyway and not see Hello Kitty and Sanrio character goods everywhere. Uh, you know, I, we saw a poster near the train station, which was Hello Kitty dressed as a firefighter, and it was something, you know, advertising like safety, and it, it was just a, a random thing, you know. It, it's just really, really everywhere, and it's such a part of their culture. Uh, one of the amazing statistics that I read in here, and I think that, that it's, the statistic is probably from about 2002, but at that, as of that time, something like 85% of all sales of Sanrio goods were within Japan. So you think about how much Hello Kitty you see at, what you say, Sears, um, Kohl's, Claire's, Target, there's so many places where you can buy this stuff, and what, only 15% of it is being sold in the rest of the world, and 85% of it is in Japan. So that's just to give you a little bit idea. And these are people that live in really, really tiny, tiny houses, you know? Uh, did you have a question? I just want to comment, yeah, like during the early 80s, I was living in the Philippines. Oh, uh-huh. And over there, yeah, San Rio and Hello Kitty was very big. In fact, mm -hmm. I remember, and I watched it, you know, the big premiere of this little uh, claymation oh, feature uh -huh. with Hello Kitty, Hello uh -huh. Meaty. And I guess, yeah, that was, it was, you yeah, know, that big there. I can only imagine what it was being in Japan. Right. Well, I mean, actually, yeah, Hello Kitty and, and the various, you know, Sanrio characters, very, very popular all throughout Asia. Very popular. I mean, obviously around the world and many other countries. But, yes, in all throughout Asia, she is very popular. One of the unfortunate things is the, the bootlegging, which I do want to talk about mm -hmm. in just a little bit. Yeah. Well, the 85% that you mentioned, that's particularly alarming. We just got back from Hawaii and we walked Oh, my it. gosh. It's the everywhere. The cultural now, difference, you would think that the sales impact yeah, just I there would be. I'm sure the statistics have changed a little bit. Like I said, the book, this book came out in 2004, so yeah, the statistic I mean, is probably from like 2002. Yeah, but in Hawaii, insane. yes, I've been to all of the Hawaiian islands, and I can tell you Hello Kitty is everywhere in Hawaii. You it's not everywhere. Work. There's a chain of uh, pharmacies, drugstores over there, Long's Drugs, and every single Long's Drugs that you go into, there's an aisle that will have Hello Kitty and different Sanrio goods all down the whole aisle, but it's it's everywhere. Um, there's uh, we were we stayed for part of our honeymoon. We stayed in the island of Lanai. It's the smallest of of the islands that's inhabited, and it, you know the population on the island is like two thousand people. The airport is about the size of this room, and there was a gift shop in there the size of a closet, and they had special Hello Kitty goods in that airport. I have a t-shirt that's a Hello Kitty Lanai t-shirt. And as far as I know, you can only get it in Lanai, um, which is sort of one of the big coups of the whole Hello Kitty collecting phenomenon is the goal of collecting items from particular places that you can only get in that particular place. So that's one of the uh, sort of uh, niche sections of the Hello Kitty collector's market. Yeah, Maui. We went into the store in Maui. Or no, actually, it was a lot of, and they had a limited edition three thousand dollar Komodo that you could only get in that store. Right, and it, they were actually selling them. They were doing really well with it because yeah. it's that cultural. They can idea. they can create this stuff.